There's a great blue heron on the skyline. Just coming across off roost, headed to breakfast somewhere. I mean, this can be a pretty noisy place, of course. Crows that are, that always have something to say. Carolina wren, Carolina chickadee, brown thrasher, northern cardinal. I mean, everything's moving. This time of day, you know, you've got Don Course that's gonna grow and grow and grow as the season progresses. And I'm hearing these pippets passing over here. Or pippet, pippet, pippet. I've been bird watching all my life, really. From like age seven or eight, I think I've, I've been in love with birds. I grew up on a family farm in Edgefield, South Carolina. So birds were constant companions. They were like best friends in, in some ways. I think to live in that rural place, that was a part of both my nature and my nurture. The time that I spent wandering in the woods between my parents' house and my grandmother's house, I would look skyward and I would see birds soaring. I would watch red-tailed hawks making lazy circles in the sky. I would watch a songbird flit from one tree to the next. And so I started to live vicariously through birds. I always wanted to fly. I always had these dreams of free flight. I used to constantly think about what the earth must look like from a migrating bird's viewpoint. There were these lost hours where no one was watching and I could do anything. I was cutting out these cardboard wings from big old appliance boxes and making parachutes out of trash bags and trying to be the little black Mary Poppins. And there was always this moment when I leapt off of some ladder or roof or out of the hayloft where I was thinking, this is it. This is it, I'm gonna take off and I'm gonna fly and everyone is going to be envious of me. But gravity always won. And so I might come home dirty or bruised, but mostly it was my secret. And so I think the die was cast and I was bound to be an ornithologist. I am an alumni distinguished professor of wildlife ecology at Clemson University. I'm also a cultural ornithologist Got to edit this down uh, 200 words by the end of the day. This children's story that I've been working on for a magazine, it's about a little boy who wanted to fly. It's, um, I guess, uh, semi-autobiographical. For a little black boy growing up in rural South Carolina, the opportunity to travel the world was something that I dreamed of. Birds gave me a very different perspective. I got to go to places that I never thought I would go through birds, and so I could watch a bird and imagine where it had been. And that really expanded my worldview and seeing beyond Edgefield and seeing beyond the ground that I stood on to think about a larger world. Birds stitch the world together, so if, if we think about the world as a patchwork quilt, and a great portion of that quilt is ocean blue, but then there are all of these other terrestrial patches of forest, of grassland, of arid lands, of wetlands, mountains. All of those patches need to be stitched together in order for the quilt to work. And so birds are sort of the needles and thread, I think, that stitch those patches together. So the bird, even that I see in my backyard, if I think about the chickadee, that's at my backyard feeder. It's not only at my feeder, that it goes to my neighbor's feeder, and then their neighbor's feeder, and then maybe elsewhere. All 
of that day, that bird is sort of living within this range. Not just my yard, but all of these backyards that then become important in that one bird's life expands you beyond your backyard. So then expand your backyard to your city park and imagine that city park being stitched to a forest. Birds help us understand that we aren't independent certainly of nature and we aren't independent of one another, that we're certainly interdependent. As I'm dreaming, I imagine streams of birds overhead migrating at night. To imagine those streams of birds dodging stars, talking to one another by chips and churs, and then I awake in the morning and perhaps one of those birds is in my backyard. If we can make those connections in our backyards and city parks and understanding how nature is shared by human beings and other beings, then I think that connectedness becomes more apparent. I can't tell you how many hours I've probably spent out here. sort of inventorying what's here now so that in years to come, as things change, we'll get better. There's an Eastern Bluebird there. So those Eastern Bluebirds, the birds and that bird flying there, these are kind of the birds that, that helped me become an ornithologist. And I always like to think that these birds are the progeny of birds that I used to watch 35 years ago. That's a lot of generations of bluebirds come and gone since then. I do so much work here from my field office, from my pickup field office. On the way to work, on the way home from work, I'm gonna find a way to drive through this place. I get to sort of record the changes that are, that are happening. I compiled a Christmas bird count here at Clemson University for 26 years. And in all of those years to see bird numbers for many species go down, go down, go down, go down. And we know that the science is telling us that billions of birds have declined in number. As bird numbers decline precipitously, we have to think about what we're doing to the earth. We've taken every bit of nature and put it in a pressure cooker. And that pressure cooker is climate change that provides this heat. And then we are destroying habitats. So we're constricting space. And we're forcing adaptation and evolution and extinction at untold rates. Let's listen for a minute. Carolina Wrens. There's a blue jay back there. Eastern Toey. The Northern Cardinal. In a habitat like this, I would really expect we would have heard a Bob White quail call by now. That sort of familiar <whistles> We haven't heard that bird. When we don't hear birds singing, that should tell us that something is amiss. We can talk about the proverbial canary in the coal mine when the birds stopped singing, coal miners knew it was time to get out. It's when we fail to listen and we fail to hear that we fall into peril. And so I think that if we step back and we're quiet and that we listen, we can think about what birds tell us. We can't be silent appreciators. We have to be vocal activists.
this little stretch. It's a little part of the world that I can have some control over. And while I'm walking along picking up trash, I can, uh, I can bird. There's the metal art. Yeah, that's kind of the, uh, the poster bird for eastern grasslands. And they're, they're cool birds to show people because they're black birds, but they're, there's, very, there's relatively little black on them. There's this lemony yellow chest with a black V in the middle of it, sort of a vest. It's long bill, but just this spectacular, spectacular song. There we go. Birds don't try, they just sort of are in this way that I think is instructive to me and in, in being comfortable in my own skin and watching birds live their lives untethered and freely is something to aspire to. I still try to envision the world from a bird's eye view. I imagine a bird that's singing this self-harmonizing sonata. That is hopefulness and optimism all wrapped up into that little brown bundle of feathers. Emily Dickinson said, hope is the thing with feathers. And so birds always give me hope. Hopefulness is one of the best tools we have to go forward. And so I have to remain hopeful, and birds give me that.